Hello and welcome everyone to the Tech Sharmit podcast. Today I am thrilled to be here with our special guest, Mr. P. J. Catalano, who has joined us all the way from United States. If I talk more about P. J., then he is an IBM Z and Linux One test architect, master inventor, and mainframe influencer. Apart from his technical expertise, he is also known for his creative memes and humorous content. that makes mainframe technology both accessible and entertaining so in this episode we are going to talk about his tech journey as well as his uh, creative content creation but before that i'd like to thank pj for joining us today and now i request you to please initiate the discussion by telling us something about yourself i am it pleasure to be here um on your podcast uh thanks for having me um as you mentioned my name is pj catalano I'm the IBM Z and Linux One test architect based out of Poughkeepsie, New York, in the United States. Uh, I've been doing tests on mainframes for a little over 20 years now. Um, it's kind of become a passion of mine uh, that I didn't expect to be uh, when I kind of got started on my journey. Um, but I'm here. I'm loving it, and I love I love engaging and talking with the community and sharing my passion with mainframes with everyone else. Okay. Okay, and if I talk about your tech journey, so uh, during our analysis, we got to know that uh, during your school days, you have prepared one system, right? So reflect, reflecting on your high school days, what initially in, uh, inspired you or sparked your interest in building computers, and how did this passion pave the way to your current role as an IBM Z and Linux One test architect? Yeah, I I growing up in the 80s and 90s, I had a big passion for video games. Um I still do. I'm still an active gamer. I love it. And kind of that passion turned into a love for computers and computer technology. Um you know, engineering wasn't even a thing I even knew existed as a field. Um I thought I wanted to be an architect when I grew up. I like drawing. Um you know, I like kind of the technical aspects of creating things and During my high school years, there was a class that they offered. Um, I really didn't know much about it, but all I knew was you got to build a computer as part of the class. And I was like, "Oh, I need to build a new computer. This sounds interesting. Let me jump in." And it was really an intro to engineering class, right? It covered, um, you know, basic intro to electronics, scientific practices, um, you know, that type of of kind of the world of engineering opened up. And as soon as I started doing it. I knew immediately that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, so from there, I actually got really excited and started looking at engineering schools for college. I went to the State University of New York um, at New Paltz, which is right across the river from the IBM Poughkeepsie site. And I was fortunate enough, senior year of my computer engineering degree, to get an internship with IBM, um, and I never left. So that's kind of how I got uh, started from video games to mainframes. and i still love both today okay and uh, regarding that project that you did like the system that you created so was it uh, your individual project or uh, there were some people in your group who created and invented that application or the system so so this, this was this was you you're thinking far too complex <laughs> what it was this was <laughs> literally assembling a pc right so depending on the group and funding right we kind of raised some funds to buy pcs we got some sponsorships um so it was kind of we had enough hardware that most people kind of it was a small class we're talking like 10 people it wasn't you know a major class so everyone kind of had a chance to kind of get their hands in there and kind of like plug cards into motherboards you know i think it was the early day the pentium generation 1 or 2 processor i'm old so um you know it was kind of just kitting up a pc right there was no real engineering in <laughs> that process itself but it kind of sparked that like oh wow You actually have to think about how these things connect. What do they do? How do they work together? Right, and that fundamental building block process um, is is it. So I, I had a lot of hands on time, and then it was just from the hardware to operating system inst installation. It was the first time I ever installed an operating system on anything, um, and and just that whole process of building pieces. Right, it's kind of like grown up Legos, <laughs> and I love Lego, so it was like kind of going to that next step and actually building something that you can actually use when you're done with it. um so that was kind of the the scope of the class the the final project if you will okay yeah so i would say that it's a kind of reverse engineering you little like you all 
perform the things and then by the thing by the time like you learn how you are doing the thing <laughs> that's <Right>. really inspiring <laughs> hands-on learning is the best learning in my experience yes because when you are in, intentionally doing something to build something then maybe like by the time you got to know that yes these are the things which you uh, did wrong and from that thing we we learned the things like what should be performed and what should not be performed so yeah absolutely Okay, and if, if I talk about your career, so mainframes have been uh, a cornerstone of your career over the two decades. So can you share what initially attracted you to uh, this field and how you uh, how your passion for mainframe has evolved over the 25, uh, I would say 21 years, the past yeah. 21 years? Yeah, when I was in college, I was uh, kind of studying fiber optics, right, at, at the end. And the kind of part of my senior design project was around fiber optics, free space optics. At the time, I thought it was a brand new emerging technology. Little did I know IBM had been doing it for the last 20 years before that on their platforms. Um, and part of my internship when I was looking at IBM is um, we had a speaker come to our university who worked on IO hardware. Um, and they were talking about all the cool things they were doing in the IO space. And it, it, it just perfectly aligned. That's what I was interested in. They had an internship opportunity available. And I was in, right? I, to me, it wasn't about mainframes. Um, it was about optics and communication. And that was my path in. And then from there, I'm like, oh, these systems are amazing. Like, yeah. <laughs> these are foundational to what we do, like, you know, became so important. And then from there, just kind of learning and growing and expanding my scope of like, all right, we start at the IO hardware and not even at the IO hardware. I started at the optic level, the little optics, the IO cards, so the different card types to the system, to sysplexes. And from there, my journey and knowledge of mainframe just started growing and I wanted to know more. And the more I learned, the more I wanted to share, because I don't think we do a great job of, of talking about the technology to people who don't know what the technology is. We do a great right. job of talking about it, that people who are aware of it, um, but kind of breaking the barrier um, and, and kind of speaking to those that don't understand what it is and why it's important um, was another thing that I saw. I was like, hey, we got to do a better job of it and kind of also started me on like being a little bit of a evangelist of the platform right because it's like we, we got to talk about it to everyone because they everybody needs to know how cool it is yeah and uh, with your uh, exposure to this it world uh, do you agree that uh, yes uh, along with the technical expertise we need uh, good communication skills as well because as you mentioned there are some time when we are supposed to interact with those who are not aware of technology but we have to explain the things to those clients maybe client or any other person who are not so much familiar Absolutely. There's a quote that if you can't explain it to your grandparents and they can understand it, then you really don't understand it. I, I believe that's true, right? Being technologists, um, you need to be able to communicate your thoughts. Um, you need to be able to communicate expectations and you need to be able to communicate to inspire, right? So communication is is a critical skill to not just in the tech industry, but I think in every industry, right. um, because if you have the greatest idea that you've developed in your brain and don't have a way to communicate it or tell other people, it'll never leave, right? So you need to be able to communicate, to express your thoughts, to work with others, to help people express their thoughts, right? And all these skills kind of tie together um, and, and all critical of being a great engineer. Right. Yeah, I completely agree with this thing that yes, com uh, communication is something that is playing the essential role in nowadays. Even like if it doesn't matter in which domain you are working in every field, communication is important because if you are not able to explain the things, then maybe it will not return the good output. So apart from this, like what all other advice would you like to give those who are especially looking for uh, pursuing their career in this mainframe technology so communication is one thing that everyone yeah. should improve. Apart from this, what all advice would you like to give? Yeah, so, I mean, mainframes is, is we use the term, but it, it is a big encompassing field, right? Um, it covers areas like, you know, the operators that actually get to touch and, and move, you know, things in the mainframe. There's, you know, application developers, there's security engineers, database administrators. So, if you have any sort of passion of technology, whether it's hardware, software, 
um, firmware, networking, security. These are all domains that we need within the mainframe space and do utilize within the mainframe space. So don't feel that if you want to get involved or interested in mainframes, you have to be specialized in an area. That's not true. Um, if you just love and have a passion for technology, there's a path to mainframe for you. So um, I would do things like grow your technical skills, communication skills, and grow your network in spaces that you're interested in, right? And growing your network could be within LinkedIn or other types of communities um, and connecting with people in those fields because that's how you kind of get that level of insight of, of opportunities to actually get roles within that uh, within that technology space like mainframes if people are interested. Yeah, uh, yes, you are right. Like if uh, we are, especially those who are new to this particular field. So if they are building a proper network, uh, maybe through LinkedIn or any other social media platform, then there are some people who are, uh, who have expertise for this particular area. So they can uh, simply reach out to them. They can seek the information and they can learn from their exposure as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, during our analysis, like we figure out that you are, uh, a master inventor at IBM. So you have had some uh, remarkable innovation. So could you tell us about one of your favorite inventions, like the, I would say, uh, the condiment cannon. <laughs> so what inspired its cre creation and what did you uh, learn from it? Yeah, so so I love the condiment cannon story. It's 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 starting to become a little bit of a a, a myth mythological uh, <laughs> okay. invention, and I and I absolutely love it. Um, one of the things that inspires, you know, the the mind to start thinking about solutions and inventions is looking at needs. Um, you know, what are things that are not being served by technology today, but also looking in the future to saying there's potential gaps because of other emerging technologies. So this one actually started, uh, we were joking around when in the United States, they were talking about the minimum wage was going to get raised. This is probably 10, 15 years ago at this point, and that there was going to be nobody working in fast food restaurants um, because they'd all be replaced by robots or touch screens. So we started thinking about, obviously this hasn't happened yet, and it was still a hypothetical. We started thinking about a world of like, what if there's nobody there making your hamburger or making right your your food, your chicken nuggets or whatever you're eating? Um, and what are the challenges that would face? And one of the things we thought of, like, hey, wouldn't it be cool to like um, be able to have a QR code on the food? So when you order something, the robot would scan it and know which kind of sauces, whether it's ketchup, you know, mayo, mustard, whatever you want and start reading it. And then from there, right, is we were trying to solve that initial problem. And this is one of the things I love about inventing is you start down a path of thinking of like a world that uh, in the future you're trying to solve, but you start encountering other problems that kind of need to get solved before you kind of go solve your initial thought path. And then this one, we quickly uncovered of, hey, is there anything today in the industry that will allow you to kind of put any type of like QR code or identifiers on things like food items uh, or other textiles, right? So we started looking at other technologies, the branding field, um, and we started saying, hey, there's opportunity here to go create um, new technologies and new inventions around how do you put information on textiles like leather or food or wood but that give you a rapidly reconfiguration option, right? It's one thing to build a static, you know, I'm going to put the same QR code on a million things versus every one I make, I want to put a different QR code on. And that inspired a, a, a series of inventions. I think there were seven US patents and 10 international patents on that kind of that idea that spawned from that condiment cannon kind of craziness. Um, but it's kind of like opening your mind and starting to think about a world in the future and the possibilities, but then really rooting it back into the technology of today and grounding it and saying, okay, that's a funny world to live in. I'm glad we thought about it, but what are the challenges we need to address? And for me, that's one of the paths I usually often take when we talk about thinking about new inventions is starting from known problems exploring that, but also leaving yourself open to say, hey, maybe there's other adjacent problems that are either easier to solve or more interesting to solve. 
Um, so don't kind of get yourself bound in like, oh, I started thinking about this thing. I have to go solve this problem. You got to keep your mind open to all possibilities. Right. Yeah. Like, because if you are stuck to one thing and if you are not thinking about other alternative ways, then might be like, there are some other possible ways like through which we can easily attain what we are looking for. So that's yeah. a good thing. Like we should be uh, open for every uh, task that we are working and we should look for the other opportunities as well. So this thing we discussed regarding the success of uh, those innovations and the stories like how they were started. But now I would like to talk a bit about the challenges, maybe related to, uh, to this innovation or any other innovation, like how personally you solve or deal with the uh, challenges because nowadays there are many people who are struggling with, especially those who are new to this uh, technology, they are struggling with some things in their day-to-day -day lives. So how you manage uh, or tackle those challenges in your life? Yeah, when, when it comes to, um, you know, technical challenges, I I, I am a big fan of never working alone. You need to get other people's viewpoints to get to the best solution. Um, you can have an idea, right? But having a diverse group of individuals also, one, agreeing that's the same challenge we need to solve, right? Because sometimes there's things that we perceive as challenges might not be perceived as challenges to others. So the more people that perceive this as a pain point or a challenge, the better, you know, you kind of are, are reaffirming that this is something you want to tackle, right? So that's the first thing right. is understanding, does this challenge actually need to be solved? Is it within my domain space to solve it? Do I have influence or access to influence to solve it? And then coming up with a best solution as fast as possible. Now, the reason it's got to be fast, and I rather fast than perfect, is because you, you could go implement a solution and see how it goes, right? If if it doesn't go well, we know we could do it fast again to come up with a better solution. But now we have some data to actually look at. If you sit and try to come up with the perfect solution, um, one, it'll take way too much time, right? And you're kind of suffering through whatever the challenges you need to come overcome. So do it fast and know you could do it fast again rather than take too much time and do it perfect. So kind of in the field of technology, you could think of things like rapid prototyping or basically quick decision-making um, because those are the types of things that will get you some real kind of experience to see, are we on the right path? Because often we try to solve something and by the time we implement the solution, it's the wrong path and we took too much time and now we can't learn and now we don't have another chance to actually go solve it again. So now we're stuck with maybe a worse problem, right? So diverse teams, quick decision-making and quick learning as to whether the solutions you enacted work are all critical in terms of how to solve kind of any challenge. And I take that for personal as well as work um, challenges is like make a decision, go with it, and then see how it goes because you'll make another fast decision. Um, if you get hung up on the decision-making process, then you'll never change anything. Right. And collaboration is something that through which we can easily think about more than one possibilities, right? Because there are multiple brains who are working with you, who are looking uh, into the solution, trying to figure out the solution for the problem that you are facing. So yeah, uh, collaboration is something that for sure help us in order to uh, make anything proper. So that's the one thing. And apart from this, like uh, if I talk about uh, the high stake projects, so creativity and divergent thinking are crucial. So especially in those high stakes projects. So how do you increase these qualities uh, in your team, uh, within your team? Any specific strategies or example that you have worked upon or that worked well for you? for this? Yeah. Team? Part, part of the creative process and we talk about divergent thinking and convergent thinking, um, one of the things that is required is a team that trusts each other, that feels safe around each other, right? Um, you know, we talk about like mental safety, right? Do, do I feel comfortable enough, one, to be myself, to be my authentic self within this group, and then two, to be able to express my thoughts, whether and not be judged by the group, whether they're good or bad, but, you know, either encouraged or poked or steered. So you have to create that mental safety net for your team. Right. And again, it depends on where you are, how big your team is. But for me, it's about making everybody feel like they're part of a community 
and that we're in this together, right? So on the test floor, right, I have about 100 engineers on the test floor that we use that we kind of go and run and test these machines is I want to make sure we're getting together as a team, not for work stuff, but for fun stuff, right? So every month we're hosting some sort of little party or event where everybody's bringing food or we're doing a silly game, just getting together, right? Getting people to talk, not about work. Yes, we're in work and yes, we're coworkers, but just talk about fun stuff, do fun things. And that sense of building community then builds that second level of, of mental um, safety, I believe, right? And I found that to be very kind of important, right? In building that network of team, because if you don't feel like you belong, then you don't feel like your opinions belong. And therefore you're kind of outside of the group and either you're you're, you're keeping your wisdom to yourself because you're too scared to share. And we as a group are losing your wisdom because you are choosing not to participate. So that sense of belonging community is so important to me that I invest a lot of my time to make sure my team is doing that regularly because some of these things don't happen naturally, especially at that scale of a team. Maybe there's pockets of people that kind of naturally fit and belong, but you, you kind of need to broaden that, right? And that's part of kind of bringing that team together to do something so they can kind of start building that trust and relationship across the team um, and enabling that. Okay. Yeah. And if, if I talk about managing the uh, mainframes, because I completely believe that it's not a everyone's cup of tea. So managing a facility with uh, more than 200 of mainframes sounds incredibly challenging. Yeah. So what are the some of the biggest hurdles you face in uh, terms of testing and ensuring the security as well as the reliability of those systems? Yeah, it, it's it's a lot of mainframes to manage. Um, luckily, we have kind of teams, so it's 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 focused, you know, kind of on a level, you know, a smaller level management, right? But at the higher level, like we have to manage the entire um, test floor together. You know, we we have a little bit more of a, um, I would say, not as stressful management policy because we're not running like production work. We're doing all testing. So if something breaks, one, that's our job to break it, and two it's okay. Like we can go fix it. Like nobody's, you know, losing uh, millions of dollars a second or something. So, you know, it's a little bit more lax there, but when it comes to testing, right. One of the biggest challenges is we've gone in IBM Z and Linux one to a more continuous delivery model, right? So we've traditionally had every two ish years, year and a half, kind of a major drop of content. And then we move on to the next major drop of content that could be hardware, firmware, feature, software, right? But we've kind of gone to now a more continuous drop of content through the year, like every six months, right? We're dropping content. And from a hardware test organization, that's kind of hard to do. In a software model, you could understand it. And software has been doing this for a long time, right? Because it's like, hey, we're just constantly iterating and delivering you. But when it comes to hardware, firmware, there's a lot longer lead time. So one of the main challenges we've been working on very hard for the last, I'm going to say three to five years is figuring out how to put the processes around, not just managing the content as it comes in for us to develop and then test and then deliver, um, but also is how do we then change priorities rapidly if business changes, if you know, something happens and we need to shift the priority if something's not going well and it needs more time. How do we do that? So one to me, one of the biggest challenges is not so much of the people in the hardware. It's about the processes to basically make the people in the hardware most efficient without causing stress <laughs> on right. the people because constant change is not good for anybody. Right. But we need to be able to have mechanisms to change to meet the needs of the business and then, you know, be able to do that in an efficient mechanism that we have kind of a way we could do it the same way consistently, not that we have to reinvent the wheel every time. So that's one of our biggest challenges from a test organization that we're kind of still working on um, and we'll continue to work on in the future. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, like if I talk about the mainframe industry, so this industry is always looking to attract fresh talent. So in your view, how can the industry uh, better appeal to uh, and retain young professional? So what... Yeah advice would you like to give those so, so i think there's there's two challenges in my mind one is making sure companies that have mainframes are creating opportunities for entry-level positions 
um, whether that be um, apprenticeships or hiring entry levels, you know, experience uh, without people without experience and train them. Um, there needs to be more of that in this industry. Second is, and I mentioned this earlier, is we need to do a better job of communicating what we do, why we do it, and why it's important, and maybe also make it a little fun to places where the next generation of mainframer are, right? So things on social media platforms like Instagram and TikTok, right, is how do we get more presence in those places? Um, because I'm there trying to scream as loud as I can, but it's we need more people to kind of also talk about it and and also highlight how cool of a job and an industry it is because it's it is fun at the end of the day it's like any technology it's just another piece of technology um it's it's kind of cool that it's niche right but at the same time is we need to make sure people are aware of it so being able to communicate in a broader sense right at the university levels and even earlier um what this is so people can kind of think about it at an early age right if i knew about mainframes in high school would I have been on a different path? I don't know. But if by not knowing about it, I fell into it. But what if we want to inspire people earlier, right? Middle school, high school, right? By college, you kind of started maybe making up your mind. So the younger we could get to it and talking to the platforms where they exist, I think is kind of the next challenge that really there's ample opportunity to kind of address that. Um, and I'm looking forward to trying to help do that myself some more. <laughs> Yeah, even I would say like you are one of the best example for this because you along with your technical expertise, you are also popular for your memes and the entertainment things that you always post related to mainframe. So especially those like who are new, they uh, they are going to interact with those memes. They love to see those things, those yeah. entertainment things. And then they uh, slightly like, like they started learning about the actual yeah. concept technology. So that's a good thing. And, and I think, you know, so so memes are, are are interesting, right? Because I think memes, generally, there's not a lot of words. It's it's usually, you know, the video meme or uh, being, you know, a picture meme is it's it's a it's a bit of a generational gap. Um, it, it, it talks across multiple generations of people, because what it actually allows you to do is people actually will infer right, based on their experience, some meaning and understanding. So it kind of gives a template for most people. And I think memes are a great way to kind of talk across the generational gap we have in the industry. Um, but I'm with you is, you know, in the fast paced world of social media, um, you need to be entertaining, right? There has to be some entertainment because if you're not entertaining, you don't get the opportunity to educate someone, right? We're really right. good at talking about our technology and kind of the traditional education, look at this cool thing, but we need to kind of take it to the next level, right? We got to be able to make it fun and exciting. So people, one, retain it, two, want to come back for more, right? So it's got to be this blend of edutainment, right? Little education, little entertainment um, and get people hooked. And that's kind of things that are being most successful in these social media spaces, Um and and thank you for saying that <laughs> I'm one of the best out there. I think it, it, it's 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 fun, it's enjoyable, and I do it because the community enjoys it. There's a lot of engagement on those memes and stuff, so that drives me to do it. Um, and it's good to hear that the community enjoys it as well. Yeah, and hum uh, humor can be the powerful tool in workplace also. Even uh, like if you would like to share any moment when humor helped you to solve a complex problem or to break the ice in the professional setting so please do, yeah. uh, do share some moments yeah so uh, humor is is great i i if you spend any time with me you know i laugh at everything or anything right because I, I my phrase is i'd rather be laughing than crying uh which is true but you know when it comes to humor but specifically laughter right we, we work in a very challenging industry right and and Look, in every tech industry, there's resources are being constrained and people are trying to figure out kind of what's the best thing to do. And when it comes to my work, you know, I, I try to come from a place where everybody is trying to basically do their best and serve kind of the business as a whole. How we come about it and our, you know, our different pain points and experiences and challenges kind of end up driving us into these places of conflict. Um, and that's where things can kind of get a little sticky. 
but to me, and, and as you said, I try to approach everything as as fun and humor and getting laughter out of people, even even when it's challenging, right? Because laughter itself is is a powerful communication tool. Um, I think I read somewhere like if you are alone, you are 30 percent less likely to laugh out loud than if you are with a group of friends or a group of people in general. So laughter in itself is a social binding mechanism. So if you have a conflict, right, the first thing that do is people start drawing cans and, and try to separate <laughs> by forcing laughter. Um you're, you're actually psychologically doing the exact negative. You're actually building a, a sense of social presence around the entire thing. Like, okay, look, we're all here to solve the problem. If we can be laughing about it and engaging, like to me, that's a starting point of, okay, now let's, 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 we set our piece, let's get back together and, and solve it for kind of the most efficient outcome, you know, from, from start to finish. So I try to approach everything with, um, you know, Look, we could sit here and argue or we could laugh about it and come up with a solution. I'd rather be laughing and coming up with a better solution than arguing and butting heads. Um, so to me, I, I laughter and humor is just a part of who I am. Um, and that's how I go about solving a lot of problems because, man, there's a lot of things to be upset about in this world. So trying to be the person or someone who's funny and bringing some light and brevity to the things is, is, is definitely where I want to be. Um, and that's how I just approach every task. Okay. So let's say if someone is struggling with their day-to-day -day tasks, so I would recommend him or her to go and check out PJ's profile because there are various humorous content that you can walk through and it will make your day. So that's one of the best thing uh, or the advice I would say that you can take from this session. So please go and check out his profile and you will find various good content. All right. So yeah, there are like numerous of topics that we can discuss, but just because of limitation of time, I would like to put up my last question, which is related to the future of this technology. So looking ahead, what excites you the most about the future development in mainframe technology? Are there any particular trends or innovation you are uh, eagerly anticipating for this? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the the future of mainframe and mainframers is, is bright. And when I look at future technology, we cannot lose sight of the people, right? Technology is great, but if you don't have the people to run it and then also inspired by it, not only from a to develop it, to come up with cool things, but also to consume it and use it so they could do cool things, um, you know, you end up with a bit of a gap. So to me, you know, I, I see a lot of great young faces, new faces to the platform that are also passionate about it. Um, to me, that gets me excited, right? Because that's that's that shows health, that shows growth, that shows people other than just me, um, the elder millennial here talking about it, right? We're, we're seeing some, you know, kind of up and comers that are, are just rock stars. Um, you know, and, and they're bringing with them, you know, a wealth of skills and knowledge that didn't exist in my time, right? Skills around automation, right? Skills around, you know, building tooling to make job, not just their job efficient, but everybody's job efficient. And then on top of that, sharing those tools with the industry, right? Via open source or, or other mechanisms. To me, that gets me super excited, right? Is the more open, the more sharing, the more communication, um, I think it benefits us all. So I look at things like uh, there's the System Z Enthusiast Discord channel, um, just the conversations that happen there, participating, seeing people excited, seeing people help each other, whether it's like, hey, I'm stuck coding this JCL or, hey, I have this new tool. I want to open source. Can we help uh, come up with a new name for it? Right. <laughs> but they, that type of, of community aspect uh, is the future of mainframe. Right. We've we've too long been in the dark and in the hiding and kind of been boxing ourselves out from each other, um, opening it up, opening up to each other, uh, I think, is kind of how we continue to grow and sustain it. Um, one of the things I'm working on now and should be available shortly this summer is we're doing another Z Skills Fest. We did one last year. We had like sixteen hundred participants sign up um last year and that's just people getting excited about the mainframe we want to run it and make it not feel like a stuffy mainframe course we want it to feel 
lively, energetic, get it run by people who are new and exciting to the industry. They excite others. We want to feel like a music festival vibe, right? So kind of bringing that sort of energy and kind of changing the culture, the mindset around what mainframe is, who a mainframer is, I think is, is something that really gets me super excited. And I think we're on an awesome path to continue to grow that and sustain that moving forward into the future. Okay. Like with this example, I think you have break all the myths that is moving around mainframe that it is about to dead or it is not popular. So you have explained all these things and I hope like viewers get the proper answer of these myths or I would say the questions. So thank you so much PJ for joining us today and for sharing uh, expertise with us. I hope you have also enjoyed this session. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. This was amazing.